versus Wild. And the star is a gentleman by the name of Bear Grills, I guess is how you say his name. And the whole premise of the show is that it is supposed to be one man against nature. And this man goes into these very wild conditions with the minimal amount of, of equipment. And just by his wits and what he can find around him, he survives. And of course you say, well gosh, he has a camera crew, obviously. It's true, but the camera crew is sworn not to help him, not to aid him, and he has to save himself from any perilous encounter. Well, I don't know if you watch that show or you like it, but it may burst your bubble to know that uh, it's not exactly as advertised. Apparently, while he's filming in California, Sierra Nevada mountains, in a particular episode where he is seen biting off the head of a snake for breakfast, that he actually spent some nights uh, with the sh show's crew in a lodge outfitted with television, stone fireplaces, hot tubs, and internet access. In another instant where grills are supposed to be surviving on a desert island, he was actually in Hawaii and spent the night in a motel. The same episode had Grills building a Polynesian-style raft using only materials around him, including bamboo, hibiscus twine, palm leaves, and palm leaves for a sail. Bear Grills actually led a team of builders to construct the raft. It was then taken apart so Grills could be shown building it on camera. And so again, this was, show was built as Man Against Wild, just a few implements, a knife, and who knows what else, and he's going to go out there and survive. And the crew was sworn, no matter what happens to the guy, you can't help him. Man against wild. Well, the truth is that a man can't save himself, especially if he's lost. This is true physically, and it's also true spiritually. He needs a savior and the good news is that there is a savior he is the son of god his name is jesus that's how we say it in english but in hebrew yeshua is his name and yeshua means savior we call him jesus christ christos in the greek where we get the word christ but it's from the hebrew word mashiach which means we say messiah it means the anointed one he is Yeshua HaMashiach. Ata Adonai means he is Lord. He is the one anointed by God to save you. That's what his name means. The one anointed by God to save you. When Jesus Christ came, he came because his coming was prophesied. For over 2,000 years, his coming was prophesied. And when he came, and he came about 2,018 years ago, all you have to do is look at the calendar and you know that, he was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life for the express purpose of dying on a cross for the sins of the whole world. He rose from the dead on the third day, and the Bible tells us that he is now seated at the right hand of God, ready to save anyone who knows that he or she cannot save themselves. I said he's ready to save anyone who's ready to simply acknowledge that he or she cannot save themselves and they need a Savior. This morning I'm going to preach a sermon out of Romans 10 verse 6 entitled how to get saved because Paul spells it out for us here in this text and it says beginning in verse 6 but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead but what does it say the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. 
That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your spirit, I pray, speak clearly to every heart, every mind, deal with every body in this place. That indeed, because you have loved us so much that you sent your son to save us, that we would be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. How to get saved on this Sunday morning. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, I've been a Christian for years. This is uh, old hat to me. I already know how to get saved. I'm glad. We need to get saved and we need to stay saved. So first of all, what Paul is telling us here in this text is that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. God alone can save us. That's why he says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. What is he telling us? He's telling us that there's nothing we can do that in any way can aid in you and I being saved. That God is the one who saves. He's the only one who has the power to save. He asks the question, who will go up to bring God down to us? In other words, Christ down. In other words, who has the ability to go to heaven and bring God down so that God can save us? In other words, what he's asking here is who among us uh, has the ability to get God's notice, to earn God's favor, to earn God's salvation so as to bring him down so that he can save us? Is there any redeeming quality? There was a movie that was out, I think, in the 50s, and they remade it. It was called The Day the Earth Stood Still. And the idea of these, uh, uh, this, these superior beings, this superior race who lives way out in deep space has been observing our planet for some time and studying us in our primitive nature and answering the question, is there any redeeming quality? Is there any compelling reason why they should want to save us from ourselves? And sometimes people think of God that way. That God is looking down and he's looking for a reason. Can anybody go up to bring him down? Well, let me, if you think that that's the case, that God's looking down to see if there's any good people. Romans 3 says, there are none righteous, no, not one. There are none who understands. There are none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. That settles it. If you thought you were the, a good person, no, you're not. Not in yourself. You thought, no, but for sure, my grandma uh, was a good person. No one is good in themselves. None of us have what could be called a redeeming quality that would compel God to come down to want to save us. No one deserves salvation. In Romans 5, Paul wrote, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us because we were good enough to earn that privilege. And he even concedes it might be possible in some, good, in some situation where someone would be willing to die in the place of a good man. But the truth is, 
God has shown his love toward us in that while we were not good, while we were sinners, he being the one who is good chose to die in our place. And so that's the first point that Paul is making here. That none of us deserve to be saved. You can't bring God down from heaven. He also says, who will descend into the abyss to bring Christ up, that is, from the grave? Now think about that imagery. We're not good enough to earn God's salvation, to attract His attention based on our goodness. We can't bring Him down. And then he asked this question, who will bring Him up? Because He died on the cross. He went into the abyss. He went into Hades to lead captivity captive. And he's saying, who has the power or the ability to resuscitate him? To bring him up from the grave. In a sense, to assist him in saving us. As if God needs our help to save us. There's a man that I know that was a police officer a number of years ago. And he told me the story. He said, actually, he was at outside. He was at church. He was at his church. And uh, there was something going on, some kind of event at the church. It was at night. And there was somebody who showed up who began to cause some trouble. And so he, being a police officer, went out into the front door, uh, the door of the church, and began to talk to the guy and, and uh, confront the guy. He was being troublesome. And next thing you know, they're in a wrestling match on the ground. And he says, this guy's trying to reach around him to grab his gun. And there are brothers from the church, ushers, who are standing by with their mouths hanging open. And he's saying, help me, help me. But none of the guys thought that maybe the cop needed some help. You know what I mean? That he was the trained professional and he was going to show them how it was done. He was actually wanting them to jump in, hold the guy down, and so they could restrain him. Sometimes, though, people think God needs our help to save, to save us. Judas, some people speculate, thought that he was helping Jesus by betraying him. You say, well, why would he think he was helping Jesus by betraying him? Because they speculate that Judas knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He saw Jesus perform miracle after miracle. Judas himself was among the twelve who went out two by two, and God even used Judas in the name of Jesus to cast out demons and to see people healed. And so they speculate that maybe Judas thought that he was doing Jesus a favor. He was helping him by betraying him, thereby forcing Jesus to demonstrate once and for all that he was the Messiah. Because they would then arrest him, they would bring him before the Sanhedrin council uh, and the elders, and there he would be backed into a corner and he would then have to demonstrate once and for all. And who knows, maybe that's how uh, uh, he would become king, king of kings and lord of lords, when push came to shove. I don't know if that was true. The Bible doesn't say that. But, but Paul is talking here about people who are th seeking to go into the abyss to raise Jesus up, to help him. Many people have tried to help God save them. That's what religion is for. That's what religious ritual is for. That is why we come up with these ideas that, well, you know, when you die, you go to heaven and there's this great big scale and God puts all your good on this side and all your bad on that side. And if your good outweighs the bad, you get to go to heaven. I have bad news for you. Romans 3 just told us there are none good. So that means when you get to heaven, if that's your, your, your theology, that means 
there's going to be a bunch of stuff on this side and nothing on that side. That in yourself, in myself, we are doomed. You see, you can't help God save. My wife told me a story years ago about when she was a little girl. Her father was a part of a mariachi group that would play in their church on Sunday mornings. And her father was very committed to this. And from time to time, they would be invited to go to other churches in the area to play on Sunday morning. And so they were invited to go to a little tiny town on the border to play a little church, a little Catholic church there. And so they got up early, got ready, drove to this little town on the border, and uh, it was locked up. There were a few people waiting to get inside, and nobody knew where the priest was. Well, he lived in a little apartment in the back. And so Patsy's dad went around the back and knocked on the door and went in, and the guy was asleep. He was also very drunk. And so she told the story. Patsy's standing there in her little frilly dress for a Sunday morning. She's probably about seven years old. And she's watching all this, and her dad says, go over there with your mom. And they got him up, she said, got him dressed, gave him some, some black coffee. Because, you see, this was critical. They couldn't just say, oh, we'll let the poor guy sleep it off. We'll just go in inside and, and have church. I was raised Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic doctrine says that there's only one person there who has the authority to administer the Eucharist, and that's the priest. He's been ordained. Not just anybody can do that. And you say, well, why is that important? Because this is Catholic doctrine. The Eucharist is necessary for salvation. Jesus clearly teaches, this is what it, what it says, Jesus clearly teaches in John 6 that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood for eternal life. He couldn't be more clear. We are saved by grace, and the Eucharist gives us grace we need to resist sin and be faithful. That's Catholic doctrine. That's not biblical doctrine, but it's Catholic doctrine. And so because of that, they believe that the priest, who is the only one qualified, uh, has to administer the Eucharist because the Eucharist is what saves you. This is what Paul was saying. Who's going to reach down into the abyss to pull Jesus up so that he can save us? As if somehow God needs our help. We have to rescue him so that he can now rescue us. He continues. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what is he telling us here very clearly he basically is saying, you speak what you believe, and you believe what you speak. You speak what you believe, and you believe what you speak. How do you get saved? This is how you get saved. Speech, what you say, is critical to you being saved. It's what saves you. This is what Paul is telling us. See, that's the thing about speech, about being able to speak. Speech is a uniquely human faculty. You say, well, no, I just saw on the news about these orcas who talk. You see that? They have video, they have trainers. Dogs have been doing it forever. Dogs did it first. Even cats. <laughs> See, he said, I love you. Animals, 
animals have been doing that forever. But it's not the same as what I'm doing right now, which is speaking. Speech is uniquely human. Why? Because man is made in the image of God. God speaks, so we speak. And the reason why we have the ability to speak is so that we can speak to God. The first human conversation was between man and God, not between man and man or man and woman. We have the ability to speak so we can speak to him. And God's word has great power, and so do your words. Your words have the power to save you. The ability to confess. That word confess is the Greek word homologio, which means to say the same thing as. And Paul is saying there's a very powerful connection between what you say and what you believe. Speech and faith. He says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. He makes that very plain. You confess with your mouth. You say it, that Jesus is your Lord and Jesus is your Savior. And then you believe in your heart that he is risen from the dead, meaning that God vindicated the, the sacrifice on the cross. He accepted the sacrifice by raising Jesus from the dead so that now we have the ability to be saved. And we believe that. See, when you believe something, it's not just something you've agreed to in your thoughts. When you believe something, it is conviction. It's something that resides in your heart and your life then reflects what you believe. You see, the heart is the part of us that believes. And the heart believes only when the mind is convinced. When you hear something, like Jesus loves you, you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and your mind hears it, your mind begins to ponder what you're hearing. Your mind has the ability to exercise reason and to weigh what you're hearing. And when you agree... When you choose to agree, then it becomes a conviction. Then it becomes what you believe. And it's in the heart where we hold the things that we believe. The mind is convinced. And when it's convinced, it becomes a conviction that resides in our hearts. We believe. With the mouth, we confess Jesus is Lord. He's my Savior with the heart we believe. You see, confession, it says, is speaking what God says. It's saying the same thing as. When you believe, when you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then how many know that's a, that affects how we speak? We begin to confess with our mouths what God says about what about anything about everything if we claim to believe and claim to be saved but our mouths confess contrary to what God says about anything or everything then we're not saved because the two are linked together homologio to say the same thing as We say what God says about anything or everything, and as we say it, it sinks into our hearts and it becomes a moral conviction. We say it. That's why sometimes people have a hard time saying it. You ever prayed with somebody and you're trying to lead them in a simple prayer and they won't pray? Or they'll pray right up to that point and, ah, and they won't go any further? Why? Why? because they feel the cognitive dissonance. They don't want to say something that they don't believe. And I think if I say it, it's going to change my heart. Six months before I got saved, give or take, I had been invited to a Christian concert. 
I showed up late, which was my usual style. Matter of fact, it had just ended. People were on their way out. And so I had been invited, so I went in and sat down real quick in case the person who invited me saw me, they might just think I had been there, which is, again, part of my style in those days. Well, that person who invited me saw me. She was a girl I knew from high school. I thought she liked me. But she had this guy with her. And so he took the lead and began to talk to me about Jesus. And so I was... We were sword fighting. I had my philosophy, and, and uh, I'm fighting him off. Finally, he said, you know what? You can find out right now if what I'm saying is true. He said, if you pray with me with an open heart to accept Jesus into your heart and nothing happens... You know it's not true. I was checkmated. Because if I said, no, I don't want to do that, I would be admitting I don't want to do that because it might be true. I don't want to confess with my mouth. So he checkmated me, and so I agreed. I didn't repent. But in my own heart, I was saying to myself, I can just say the words and not be sincere, but I would be doing that on purpose because I'm afraid it's true. And basically, I said this prayer, and I opened my heart that much. I didn't get saved that night because I didn't repent. But I was honest enough to where I was driving away, and in my heart, I even said it out loud. I said, my life, everything is going to change. And it did. My life went right down the toilet for those next six months. I began to do things I said I would never do. I was a sinner with standards. Well, those standards got blown out the window. My life became almost unlivable. About a month before I got saved, I was doing drugs. It was the first time I had what they called a bad trip. Long story short, I was being tortured. After a little bit of larceny and some more drug taking, I remember passing out in a park and I'm hearing a voice. And the voice is the voice of a woman. And she's saying, get away from him. Get away from there. And I woke up. And there's this little kid staring down at me, probably about five years old. And it was his mother trying to get him away. I sat up, disoriented. It was in June, Tucson. It was already hot. I had no shirt on. I had long hair that was matted, grass stuck to my hair and my back. And I remember saying, what's happening to me? My life was spiraling out of control. About a month later, a friend of mine invited me to another Christian concert. I went to that one, resisted, went back the next night, thought it was another concert. It was a church service. I resisted, but that was July 2nd, 1978. And in my front yard that night, I fell on my knees. I had enough. I surrendered. I repented. And Jesus is the Lord of my life today because I confess with my mouth and I believed in my heart and God saved my soul you see what we believe and what we say are tied together what a person truly believes is going to come out of his mouth eventually now we can all say things that we don't mean Imagine now, this guy walked into a theater, and they were rehearsing. He sat down, and it was a man dressed in biblical-style garb, and he was quoting the Bible with great passion and great conviction. And this person's sitting there, and he's moved by what he's hearing. Finally, off stage, somebody drops something, 
And this man who was on stage broke character and said, when the world's going on over there and began to curse. And so this guy sitting there, he, one moment he's speaking the word of God with power. The next moment he's cursing. You say, well, you know, he was just acting. Exactly. You see, the word hypocrite in the New Testament Greek means play actor. It means to hold a mask in front of your face. Anybody can play act. But, you know, he's up there on the stage. He's an actor. He's saying one thing, but in the next moment, beep. Why? Because he was acting. See, what's inside comes out. In Matthew 12, Jesus said, Either make the tree good or its fruit, and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers? How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, or by your words you will be condemned. That's Jesus talking. Because what we believe and what we say are inseparably linked together. And this is critical when it comes to being saved because speaking and faith are tied together. What we say with our mouths either reinforces our faith or it contradicts our faith. How many know we're supposed to confess what we believe? When I did get saved, I had to talk about it. I got saved one moment there on that night I'm talking about, and literally within a few minutes, I was talking to my brother about it. Why? Because he said, hey, Ray, let's go get high. And I began to tell him that I wasn't going to do that anymore, that I had become a Christian. When Jesus is the Lord of your life, it's something you're going to want to confess. In Matthew 10, he says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You see, when you believe, it's going to show up in what you say. It's going to come out of your mouth. We are saved by what we say. We confess. We open our mouths. We use the God-given faculty of speech. And we say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. We believe in our hearts. And the Bible says that is what saves us. Finally, as I close, his salvation lasts forever. And that's a good place to say amen. It's a, it's a, it lasts forever. Listen to what it says in verse 11. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I tell you something about his salvation? His salvation stands the test of time. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. What does that mean? It means he's not going to leave you hanging. That means that you're not going to put your faith in Christ today and you really begin to serve God and somewhere in the future, he's going to burn you. Somewhere in the future, he's going to leave you hanging. Here you committed yourself to him and you're going to be put to shame. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. He's not going to leave you hanging when you put your trust in him. As a matter of fact, your faith and your commitment are going to be vindicated by the passing of time. I got saved as a young man and this was something new and radical. 
My parents were very worried about it. I thought they would be happy that I wasn't going to be taking drugs anymore. I thought they'd be happy that I was going to change my lifestyle. But all they could see is that I was changing religions. In their minds, forsaking my heritage. And so there was a big uproar in my extended family. I witnessed to my cousins, and they began to pray to get saved. But there was this immediate backlash where their parents were forbidding them to go to my church about 10 years later I'm pioneering a church in Salt Lake City, Utah talking to my brother and he recounted a conversation that my mother had had with my aunt and my aunt told my mother I wish I had allowed Liz my cousin to go to that church that's 10 years later why? because Liz had prayed to give her heart to Jesus her parents shut that down wouldn't let her go to church six months later she was pregnant 10 years had passed and her own mother said I wish I'd let her go to that church 10 years later my mother is telling my aunt about what's going on with me and my brothers, my sister. By that time, we're all married. We all had kids. My mother had a lot of grandkids whose parents were still married to each other. Why? Because your faith and your commitment are vindicated by the passing of time. When you're saved, time's on your side. If you just hang in there, and just keep doing your best every day to obey God. And if you stumble, just repent and get back up and just keep going. Time is on your side. The more time passes, the greater your decision to believe will appear. In Psalm 37, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anchor. Forsake wrath and do not fret. It only causes harm. That means as, as we just simply hang in there. We just simply serve God as best we can from day to day. Continue to confess Jesus is my Lord. Continue to believe in our hearts. That time's on our side. That our imputed righteousness will only shine brighter and brighter. And then it says, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. That's just God's way of telling us he doesn't have any favorites. Can I tell you something about God? He is an equal opportunity savior. He will save anybody, anywhere, anytime. And that's the wonderful thing about the one who saves. What that's really saying is not that he doesn't discriminate, but it's saying that when he saves, it's, all, it's always very personal. In other words, when I got saved, I didn't get saved in a group. Anybody who gets saved, when you got saved, it wasn't in a group. Oh, yeah, me and my friend got saved. Me and my family got saved. No, God saved you personally. When I got saved that night, I remember in my heart wondering why God cared so much about me because I felt it I felt his love I really felt his love I felt like it was personal and I kept thinking why in the world would he care so much about me what is it about me you've heard the saying and it's true if you were the only person on earth he still would have died for you Christian you didn't get saved in a group you were chased down. He's the one who chased you down. You didn't find him. He found you. 
and he chased you down, and he saved you personally. Sometimes it's good to remember where you came from, Christian. Sometimes it's good to look back at your life before you knew Jesus and kind of examine the details of your life because what you're going to find are God's fingerprints all over it. You're going to find the evidence of his pursuit and how he worked in this situation and that circumstance and this thing to get your attention, to bring you to him, to bring you to that moment when you finally did choose to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and be saved. It's always very personal. And let me tell you one other thing about him. He longs for the day when you can see him face to face and be with him forever. You. Finally, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I tell you something? English translators do their best to translate Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek of the New Testament. But those languages are different. One of the things that makes them different is that there are certain words in Greek, for example, that are outside of tense. Tense, past tense, present tense, future tense. There are certain words and concepts that stand outside of tense or time. In other words, it's always now is a, is a better way to put it. And this is a good example. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is present tense. It's not past tense. It's not future tense. It is today. In other words, today, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't mean you can call on the name of the Lord and get saved. It means that as you are calling on his name, you are saved, is what it's saying. It's what we do today. Today, when you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. It's about today. You can't do anything about yesterday. It's done. You can't do anything about tomorrow. It never comes. But what we do today matters. What we do now, today. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's why you hear me say it. You got saved because you prayed. You stay saved because you pray. All it's saying is whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If it is you today who calls on the name of the Lord, you, you're saved. Because Christians call on the name of the Lord. It's who you are today. And it's who you are every day because every day is always today. So how do you get saved? You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus You believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead today. And God will save you forever and forever and forever. He will save you. He personally, the one who's been chasing you down all this time, will save you. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Every head bowed, every eye closed. How do you get saved? Friend, that's an important question because we can't save ourselves. We can boast, we can claim, we can try, but in the end, the same result, we're lost. But thank God there is one who wants to save us, who can save us, the Savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We can be saved because we have a Savior, Christ the Lord, who was born of the virgin, who lived the sinless life, who went to the cross and died there as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, who rose from the dead the third day, just as the prophets had foretold. Now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ready and able to save anyone who simply would come to that place and admit, I can't save myself. I can't save myself. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. He will save you now. Every head bowed just for a moment. 
every eye closed if that's you on this Sunday morning you're realizing all this time all these years there is a God a God who knows you and loves you and has been chasing you down but you run from him but you're finally at a place this morning where you're just willing to say God I'm tired of running I need a savior I need a savior if that's you would you do one thing very quickly then just lift your hand up right now so I can see it saying I'm tired of running Pastor Ruby I need Jesus as my Lord and as my savior would you lift your hand right now please don't wait it's a choice you make no one can make it for you you have to choose him he's already chosen you but he won't violate your will you have to choose him lift your hand you're realizing God brought you to this place today for this this is not about religion friend it's not about joining the right religion or the right church that doesn't save anybody only Christ is the one who saves and you're realizing right now in a very personal way that he's reaching out to you every head bowed every eye closed just right where you're sitting, lift up your hand. I'll see it. You can put it right back down. Lift it up. Lift it up. Maybe at one time you were saved. You did accept God's offer of forgiveness. You know your sins were forgiven. But you made a choice to go back to the sin that had been forgiven. That's a choice you made. You're backslidden and you want to repent of your backsliding. Would you lift your hand right now? Yes, he does love you that much. He will take you back. He will forgive you. But you have to respond. Please lift your hand. I'll see it. You can put it right back down right where you're sitting. Lift it up. You're not saved this morning or you're backslidden. Lift your hand. Then I'm speaking to God's people for a moment. Come to church. The title of the sermon is How to Get Saved. Well, duh. I know how to get saved. Sometimes we have to be reminded there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. There are none who are good. We have to understand that. It never begins in faith and ends in works. It's God's love and God's grace that saves us. The Christian, what we speak with our mouths and what we believe in our hearts are inseparably linked because we got saved because of what we said what we chose to believe in, in, in our hearts and that remains the, the same thing throughout the years Jesus said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and we will give account for every idle word in the day of judgment why? Because what comes out of our mouths is the direct reflection of what's in our hearts. A direct reflection of what we believe. Not what we say we believe. But what is actually in our hearts. It's like the man sitting in the theater, shocked that this man could be quoting the Bible one moment and cursing like the devil in the next. But he was just acting exactly he was just acting if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart you will be saved for whoever calls on the name of the Lord that's past tense present tense future tense it's outside of tense whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved yes it's talking about a life, a lifestyle. Somebody who does that today, because it's always today. Let's stand together this morning. The altar's open for those who may not be saved or you're backslidden. This is your opportunity. Someone will meet you here, friend, to pray with simple prayer of repentance. You'll never be the same. Never, never. For God's speaking to your heart. Christian, remember, it's, all, it's always been personal. It's always been personal. 
He's known you from your mother's womb.